Well, folks, we're not open line, open topic. Not for the first hour, because I have a guest. Okay, And I've told you Tom Harris from ClimateScienceInternational.org was going to be on tonight. Because our provincial government wants to bring in carbon taxes. They had a public meeting last week at the RA Center. Now, their stated purpose was to get feedback on what people think about carbon taxes. Forgive me, but I don't I don't always trust our provincial government. And you know, I I've seen what they've done for the last 12 years. So when I hear they're looking for feedback, I take that with a grain of salt. But my good friend and a good friend of the show here, Tom Harris, who I would describe as a climate realist, um, the real climate deniers are the ones that are trying to tell you that we're affecting climate change. They're in denial of scientific facts. In fact, they're even fudging and putting up fraudulent scientific facts to promote their trillion-dollar agenda. That's not conspiracy theory stuff, folks. That's just the way it is. When you look at the cold, hard data, and we'll look at it tonight, the climate has been changing since creation. It's what the climate does. There is no proof whatsoever that we are even having an iota of influence on the climate. And yet the the liberal left has got everybody convinced that, oh my goodness, if we don't spend billions and trillions of dollars... We're going to be cooking. Well, they don't say that anymore because, you know, they can't say that anymore because the temperature's not warming up. So now, you know, we're, we're causing climate change. In other words, we're causing something that's been changing since creation. And they've got people believing them as well. Tom knows the science way better than I do. And, Tom, you were at the – welcome to the show, by the way. Yeah, thanks, John. You were at that meeting. Was it Thursday night? It was Wednesday night, yeah. It was Wednesday night. Okay, so how many people were there? Just over 100. And over 100? Yeah, they had room for about 100, and they packed it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it was a good attendance. How long a meeting? It was two hours, 6 until 8 p.m. They gave an introductory presentation, which was to tell us all the facts and what we were supposed to comment on based on, and then they opened it up for questions. And I So managed... there, when they say uh, they gave a presentation to tell you all the facts, they just spewed out the regular stuff that they always say about, you know, how horribly dangerous a situation we're in. If we don't take your money and put it into, you know, uh, uh, the whole carbon industry, we're all going to hell in a handbasket. Basically, that's what they said? Yeah, essentially. And okay. they, it was funny, the very first sentence in uh, Karen Clark, she's Minister of the Environment spokesperson, a very nice person, actually, but uh, not particularly well informed about the issue. But regardless, she started out by saying, scientists around the world agree that climate change is happening. <laughs> no. Yeah, but climate change has been happening since creation. I know, I know. It's funny. I, I mean, took, I mean, like, <laughs> I took the text from her presentation and I sent it to about fifty scientists around the world because I audio taped it and then I typed it all in all night. <laughs> you transposed it into into typing it out. Yeah, that's right. And you are, I, you are committed to this, aren't yeah. you? <laughs> and I sent it to scientists, about fifty of them, and about a dozen responded, and four of them actually I cite in today's article. Uh, in the Guelph Mercury, okay? If you go to the GuelphMercury.com website, you have an article. Okay, can you tweet that to me so I can get it out to everybody that's listening here tonight that follows me on Twitter and goes to the Late Night Council Facebook page? Because we want to make that available, people, because I'm sure you'll be referring to that tonight while you're on. And, folks, he's only on with us till 10 o'clock tonight. At 10 o'clock, we're going open line, open topic. There's some other stuff I have to get to. But if you want to talk to Tom Harris tonight, and we'll open up the phones in a bit. We're not opening them up yet. But you can tie up a line right now, okay? 521, and, and for the first hour, it's nothing but climate change tonight, okay? And what's going on in the latest in the, in the, in the battle to get some realism in there instead of, you know, uh, wasting trillions, literally trillions of dollars on uh, uh, what is amounting to a pretend problem. 521-8255 is the Ottawa number. That's 521-8255. You quoted a number of these scientists in yeah. your response into the article you wrote that's where again? It's in the Guelph Mercury. At, and it and will be out on, on the Late Night Council Facebook page before the end of this program. So now you'll be able yeah. to read the whole thing. So continue, now, now, the beauty of this is that the Guelph hearing is tomorrow night. Okay, it's in. So the, this was in the Guelph newspaper today, right? It's just the night, the night before the hearing, the, the same <laughs> yeah. type of hearing they have in Ottawa. Exactly they're having in the Guelph, same. Okay? Yeah. So they may be quickly rewriting some of their script right now because I asked Dr. Ball and Dr. Patterson and Madhav Kandekar and a water resources specialist by the name of Don 
Farley, who lives across in Gatineau, if these statements were true. And, you know, I got answers from a dozen, but I picked just those four people to quote in the Guelph Mercury, and it's up there right now. None of which are who are funded by uh, the oil industry. No. <laughs> they all hold down positions of tenure in universities, and the one that, ones that don't are retired university professors. Yeah, that's right. And, and you know, the, the interesting thing is that the whole premise of the paper and the whole premise of, la- of last Wednesday's hearing was that the science is settled and that there is no doubt. So they were there only to discuss... If the science is settled, I'm sorry for interrupting, yeah. if the science is settled, why do they keep flogging that? Why do they keep telling that? <laughs> it's obviously not. Well, Otherwise, they wouldn't have to I'll, keep trying to convince people yeah. by telling them over and over and over and over and over and over again. And I'll tell you why they keep saying that. It's because they want defense against what actually happened at the Ottawa hearing. I don't know if we have three minutes and 40... No, we're going to play that when we get back. Okay. We've, got, we've got three minutes and 25 seconds of audio... That was taken right from the meeting, and, and when we come back from the commercial, Tom, you'll be able to set that up, and, and sure. we'll, we'll hear about, uh, you know, you're going to tell us what we're going to hear of, you know, what actually happened there, because i got a lot of questions about that yeah. meeting. But, you know, you have to say the science is settled if you're only going to talk about solutions. See, one of the things they don't seem to understand is that a rational discussion of how much money you're going to spend adapting to climate change, which is a good thing to do, of course. Of course it is. Yeah. Or In fact, much- I've said all along, if this problem was as real as they say it was then all our money should be going into adapting instead of trying to change it because nobody's proven that we can change it whatsoever. Well, well, you'll hear at the end of this audio, and in fact, I'll set it up later, but the bottom line is that you cannot have a rational discussion as to how much you're going to spend on adaptation versus supposedly stopping climate change if you also don't discuss how certain is it that we're causing dangerous climate change. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. It's kind of like debating how you're going to kill all the rabbits in Ontario without discussing whether we should. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. And yet, you know, it's upwards of about a trillion dollars worldwide oh, yeah. now. Oh, yeah. A trillion dollars yeah. not to adapt, yeah. not to help people relocate or anything like that, if it's true, because those yeah. solutions would actually help people. Well, but they're not exactly. doing that. They're, yeah. they're, they're putting all the money into, into a canard that they've convinced people that we can change the climate, which they have not no. proven at all. Well, we can't even forecast climate change properly, and that's evident because the last 18 years there's been no warming, and none of the computer models that the UN and Obama and, and even, and sadly, the Harper government and, of course, the Wynn government, none of the models that they're relying on for future forecasts forecast an 18-year pause. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you have to say, well, if the models that they're basing all this excitement on have not worked for 18 years, how can you use it for forecasting the future? I think I think people that are just, you know, uh, lunch bucket, I just go to work, I try to put food on my table, trying to uh, pay off my mortgage, trying to keep the kids happy and everything. The fact that a trillion dollars can be spent, you know, on something that is based on such shaky science... That ought to that ought to scare people half to death. Yeah, it should also that you, could, that you can spend that kind of money with no scrutiny, yeah. with no proof, mm-hmm. with 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 uh, you know, and and to the point where you know even the data that is coming out is being proven to be fraudulent, and for the purpose of you know promoting a political agenda as opposed to accurate readings. We've even got organizations now that are changing the the climate data in the 30s and 40s and 50s to make look look like the planet is warming when and and nobody is holding their feet to the fire. Nobody is putting these people at you know and exposing them for the frauds and the hypocrites that they are. Yeah, and yet the right. public is is buying this. The public is getting ripped off by by billions of dollars. And and the battle against it, I can't believe it. Yeah, well, happily, as you'll hear after the break, the Ottawa hearing had some pushback. Okay, we're going to hear from that when we get back with Tom Harris from Climate Science International. He's going to tweet me that article. I'm going to put it out so you can read it at your leisure. And you're going to hear about three and a half, three and a half minutes of audio from that. I guess you could call it the propaganda uh, you know, tour for climate change for the provincial government, setting us up to uh, uh, slap carbon taxes on pretty much everything. Because you know what kind of debt we've got in this province, and this is one of the ways they're going to extract cash from us. You need to know what's going on, and you're going to be a lot wiser and a lot more intelligent after tonight's show tonight. Right back after this. Stay with us. CFRA. The callers are screened. The host is not. You've been warned. This is Late Night Council on 580 CFRA. We are not open line, open topic. Tom Harris from Climate Science International is with us. And uh, last Wednesday night, the provincial government held a, oh, I guess a promotion tour 
to set us up for a radical increase and in, in putting carbon taxes upon us. And uh, they invited the public to come and hear what their plans were and try to convince people that we've really got to do this because we're all going to hell in a handbasket if you don't give us money, okay, concerning climate. Well, Tom Harris was there. Now set this uh, clip up here, Tom. What are we going to hear here? Yeah, what we're going to hear is just at the very beginning of the question period, they gave us a chance to question the context of the meeting. They defined the context as the climate change is settled. It's, you know, we're headed for catastrophe unless we take strong action. And so I got up and I asked them a question. Shortly after me, another person got up and you can hear what happened. Okay, play it up, Steve. Yeah, hi. Um, My name is Tom Harris with the International Climate Science Coalition. Concerning the context, I think it's too limited. And I'd like to just read four sentences from a hearing from Professor Patterson. He's an earth science climate specialist. He uh, testified before the House of Commons Committee on Environment and Sustainable Development. He said this, and I think it applies very much to Ontario, these four sentences. If Canada's government is to base climate policy on real science, then it must accept that its policy direction should be changeable as climate science advances. Otherwise, policy becomes disconnected from science, and we may waste billions of dollars going in entirely the wrong direction. Until we have a far better understanding of the underlying science, the government should cancel funding allocated to stopping climate change, which, according to Dr. Patterson, is ridiculous. He says the only constant about climate is change. Now, in support of his point of view, I have a book here called The Non-Governmental International Panel on Climate Change, and it lists literally thousands of peer-reviewed studies published from the world's leading journals that actually show that a fair number of your context statements are at least debatable and perhaps, at least in their opinion, wrong. And so I'm just wondering if you'd like a copy of this, if you'd like to read it, and I can give it to you right now if you'd like. Would you be interested in open science hearings on both sides of the issue? Well, I think that's a question for the government. Are you not representing the government here? I'm really uncomfortable with the uh, term climate change because it started out as global warming and then sort of morphed into climate change when the when Al Gore's predictions didn't really come true. I here a chart of a uh, 19 year talk says we haven't had any global warming for about 19 years, since 1998 or so. We're going to get to talk about that, and we're also going to get to talk about how the biggest greenhouse gas, about 95% of the Earth's greenhouse effect, is water vapor, and carbon is not an atmospheric pollutant. So if they're going to tax and price carbon, they're not going to price like me breathing out after each breath. I mean, <laughs> 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 the climate denial work is here in the forest. It just really sounds like the, uh, the fix is in, like the science is in when it is really highly debatable. Just to touch on uh, the gentleman to the right. <laughs> 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 then you should be able to defend your position, to defend the science. Oh, 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 why don't we open that gentleman's book over there? Okay, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. We said range. Remember, I said there's always a box. Remember, I said there's always a box. The box here is in one of the first slides. Karen said the government has accepted that climate change exists. It sounded like you were criticizing their God. Oh, my goodness. Because man. instead of defending the science, oh, science is settled. Science, I hear that all the time. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, uh, and I tweeted out there, and folks, uh, you can read Tom Harris's article that's in the Guelph Mercury today. Read it at your leisure. I've tweeted out there. If you go to the Late Night Council Facebook page or you follow me on Twitter, you can read the article that uh, uh, Tom is referring to. I mean, we hear this subterfuge all the time, this oh, shell yeah. game. The science is settled. The science is settled. When you know and I know there has never, there has never been a credible survey of scientists on the question as to whether man is causing climate change. And anything remotely close to a survey 
It's nowhere near even even 10 or 20 percent that believe that. Yeah. And yet they get away with this lie mm-hmm. instead of defending their science. The science is settled. The, sci- the science is not settled. Yeah. The, the trouble is they ask scientists who are not in the field and they ask scientists the wrong question. OK. They, the, the real question is, are our CO2 emissions, because that's the main greenhouse gas we're worried about, are they causing dangerous climate change? Okay, if they're causing a tenth of a degree change over a decade or so, who cares? It's not important. It shouldn't be a public policy issue. It doesn't change culture at all. It doesn't change anything we do. The only reason why it should be a public policy issue is if it's dangerous, okay? And if we have some kind of certainty that that's actually going to happen. Because certainly in the last century, we saw a 0.8 degree rise in temperature, which was like we might have experienced in this room since the interview started. It makes no difference. And you wouldn't even have noticed. That's right. And they also ask many people who are the wrong people to ask. They ask people who study the impact impact of climate change on their bark beetles or their forests or whatever. If you actually ask scientists who study the causes of climate change, what's it going to be like in 20 years? The standard answer you get is, ask me in 20 years. Yeah. They don't know yeah. because the science is much too immature. And the ones who pretend to know, I guess they've got this political agenda there. Oh, because yeah. Because anybody that's really honest with the science, and we've learned this in the last 15 years, because you know how interest in climate and environment and meteorology has gone through the roof. Oh, yeah. And if yeah. anything, you know, the, the, the recent findings in, in, in uh, meteorology and climate science have proven that we are not warming up and we're not having any, any I know. effect on climate change at all. But they don't want anybody yeah. to hear that. Well, they want to keep the public good and stupid, not asking questions. So they can, you know, bring in another, in, 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 in Ontario's case, another maybe one or two or three billion dollars. Yeah, that's right. You know, it's interesting because a little after us, a guy stood up and he said he has a Ph.D. in physics and he used to work for Natural Resources Canada. And the point he made, was, which was beautiful, really, is he, it's in my YouTube video. If you go to our homepage, climatescienceinternational.org. That's right. I know you, it better than you do. Yeah. <laughs> but I made a YouTube video of the, of the input from the skeptics. And Dr. Packwood, uh, he specifically gave uh, a really nice summary as to why what we were hearing in that meeting was not science. While the moderator, you know, obviously took sides, as you could hear, because he had a box defined as to what was legitimate to talk about, he did let us speak. Mm -hmm. Okay, and he did. And in fact, at one point, he told the audience to calm down because we wanted to hear people's opinions. So he told the audience to calm down that we're dissing, you know, you people that are bringing up the scientific side. Well, right. And and in fact, he allowed the Ph.D. in physics to speak for a good four or five minutes, which was excellent. So there is pushback. And so I say to people who are having future hearings like tomorrow night in Guelph and the next night in Windsor, Ontario, don't be afraid to get up and question the yeah. government's dogma because nobody shoots you. Oh, yeah, they may yell at you and stuff like that. But the government themselves were very polite. You, and the coordinators did respect our input, even though they obviously didn't want you it. You are very accurate in calling it dogma. Yeah. Because it is, it, is, it is such, you know, weak science. Yeah. And it's been, it's been pretending to be science for uh, over a decade now. And it is dogma. It's turned into religious dogma. All you have to do is listen to David Suzuki's latest speeches on the climate. And he has jumped whole heartedly out of the realm of scientific and into the uh, into the realm of religion now okay? yeah well here listen to this this is in the government's uh, climate change discussion paper 2015 which is what the meeting was about if governments do not take strong action to reduce global emissions within the next decade oh it's always within the next decade. oh yeah it was 10 years ago <laughs> yeah you know? we will see at least a four degree rise in global temperatures which while appearing a small difference will in reality trigger irreversible change to the ecology of our planet. A four degree rise in 10 years. Like that is yeah. that is sensationally ludicrous. Well, especially since we only had 0.8 degree rise in a century, yeah. we've had no rise for over 18 years. And we've got we've got more snow cover on yeah. the planet now than at any other time since they've been make, taking measurements, is that yeah. true? Oh yeah, actually if you look at the National uh, Snow and Ice Data Center out of Colorado, the overall northern hemisphere snow extent has been increasing. And of course, the great, the Antarctic has been increasing in snow cover and lowering in temperature, setting all kinds of low temperature records. One thing, John, that has just come up, I just read it yesterday, is apparently the pH data has been manipulated, the pH data for the oceans. You know, the evil twin, as Al Gore called it, I think it was Al Gore, to global warming was ocean acidification. Yeah. Okay, it turns out that many of the actual 
uh, forecasts were based on computer models. They were not based on data before about 1970. Not, yeah, not measured data at all. Yeah. It's computer models, Appa- I know. Apparently, before 1970, we had good pH readings of the ocean way back to about 1900. And this particular student uncovered it. I'm looking into this more. But if you search Marita Noon, N-O-O-N, she's the reporter that covered it, she actually found that they disqualified the early data because it doesn't show warming. Yeah, They're using yeah. computer simulations, yeah, yeah. and they ignore the data before about 1970. Five two one eight two five five is the number to call. We're going to start taking calls now, okay? Got a number of people want to get on, and uh, Tom is only with us till 10 o'clock tonight, okay? So if you want to talk to him, five two one eight two five five in uh, Ottawa, star 580 on the Bell Mobility System. And if you're calling from Canning, Nova Scotia, if you're calling from Podunk, Vermont, if you're calling from Moon Run, Pennsylvania, or Gold Dust, Tennessee, one 800 Five eight zero two three seven two is the long distance line. Quick break for the news and back with Tom Harris from ClimateScienceInternational.org, www.ClimateScienceInternational.org. And you can go on the Late Night Council, Council Facebook page and read the article that is in today's Guelph Mercury on what happened here at the IRA Center on Wednesday night. More of this when we get back. Stay with us. Are you ready to take some calls, Tom? I am, and I just want to tell you one thing. We better put up a big fuss because the government webpage says this. The minister is to present a carbon pricing initiative in the spring. Yeah. Okay. This they're, is they're not- committed, they're, you know, and that's why, you know, these public hearings are a farce. They got their mind made up and, and, and they're a total PR initiative. They could have every one of those meetings, people coming against them and saying, look, at the science is not there. You're wasting your money. We don't want you to do this. Chairman Wynn doesn't have to back off. She's got a she's majority. Got, she's got a majority, and she's going to do. And, and they've already proven there's no way they can curb their spending. Okay, yeah. they don't know how to run the economy, so they have to look at new revenue streams, and they will take advantage of people that are not clued in, who don't know what's going on. Oh yeah, well we're going to die. We don't. Well, yeah, that's why you know the mean? public have got to keep giving input until the 29th. They are inviting public input. They have a nice yeah. form on the web page. If you go to our www.climatescienceinternational.org website, we have a direct link to where you can. Tell Tell them what you think about a carbon tax, and it really is a carbon tax. They say carbon pricing; it might be cap and trade. Effectively, it's a carbon. Yeah, tax. of course it is. Of course it is. Five two one eight two five five. Kathy in Marmara, you're on the line, Kathy. Hi, I just heard you refer to it as a carbon tax too, and I'm thinking of it as a carbon dioxide tax. So, oh, sorry, you're right. Well, my big <laughs> totally. question was because I, you know, I can speculate on why the government keeps calling this carbon pricing, carbon tax. But have you ever yet heard a meeting facilitator or anyone from the government be asked publicly and forced to explain why they keep making this? Well, yeah, Ron Pack, Rod Packwood did exactly that, the PhD in physics. He got up right. and he said, point blank, he said, would you people start doing this properly? He said, it's not carbon that's a solid substance. Carbon dioxide is benign. It's plant food. That's what you're talking about regulating. So he did a great job there, but they went right back to the same old stuff. So, But what, what we need, though, is we need to inundate the government with input. And at least, you know, in this case, the input, if you want, I mean, you can, you can submit the input confidentially, but the input is visible to all the public. And it will become a media story if there are hundreds of public pe- members saying, look, don't do it, and they still go ahead and do it. It will become a story. Okay, well, I won't keep you because I know there's probably other callers, but that is probably my pet peeve. But I would love to see them forced to change it on their site and everywhere else to a carbon dioxide tax. And They're not going to be forced to do anything. <laughs> I think people Kathy. need to scream about that one. Yeah. Anyway, thank you very thank much. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you for um, waiting on hold, too. 521-8255 is number to call. That's 521-8255. Here's Bruce in Ottawa South. Hi, Bruce. Good evening, gentlemen. Mr. Harris, I uh, had the pleasure of meeting you after the conference. It was a pleasure. Oh, great. Thanks. Okay, the conference or the meeting last Wednesday? Last okay. Wednesday, yeah. The I meeting. remember. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Nice That's to meet right. you, too. At what point are we going to stop and say, how much can we sustain and how much are, can we really go on with this and who's going to pay for it? Like we're talking, some people are saying, well, your grandchildren are going to pay for it scenario. Isn't there uh, an ethics or some kind of a morality to people making these decisions to look at that? Yeah, it's strange. Eh? They, they talk about the morality of doing nothing and, and you know, exactly. we're going to destroy the climate, but they never talk about the morality of lumping more and more billions onto the debt for our kids. Yeah, and how do you know when we've made the change? I how know. do you know when we've infected the climate? Because the climate is changing all the time. Oh, yeah. There is no measuring sticks when, you know, you can say, okay, we've solved the problem. There's no way to know because yeah. we, they haven't established there, there that will, there is a problem. Yeah. There, actually, there actually is a way. 
And the way we'll know is when we're off this planet and the next generation. <laughs> yeah. well, it's true. When, we get, yeah. when we're off this planet and the next generation looks at the hypocrisy and says, these people were saying this while doing that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, well, you know, we, and two or three generations from now, they're going to realize how, how great you know, fools our culture was for buying this claptrap and wasting literally trillions of dollars that could have, that could have saved lives yeah, in you, third world countries that you know, need to adjust to the climate change the way it is right now. They need irrigation. They need uh, you know, hospitals. They need orphanages. They need everything that, you know, that, that third world countries struggle because of a warm climate. Yeah, and yet we're spending you know, billions of dollars, uh, you know, actually trillions a year on something that we cannot differentiate from natural variability. The signal of climate influence by humans is too small to see in comparison with the natural signal. So, I mean, it's really, you know, counting angels on the head of a pin. And we need, we need 50 it's superstition. Oh, yeah. It is superstition. It, it's crossed the line from science into philosophy, uh, philosophy and, and theology long ago. Yeah. Well, they asked Gina McCarthy, you know, they asked Gina McCarthy at hearings in the Senate. She's the head of the EPA. How much would the American regulations on the coal stations impact global climate? And she had to admit it would have no impact, at least no measurable impact. But here's the reason they're doing it. And it's the same reason the Ontario government is doing it. Because, of course, if the whole U.S. would have no impact, you can be sure Ontario would have no impact at all. The reason they're doing it was summed up by Gina McCarthy. She said, and it logically makes sense if we had a real global crisis. She said, we want to lead the world. Lead China, lead India, lead the other countries to do what's necessary to save the climate. Now, <clears throat> the problem with that, of course, is that even if it were true that we were causing dangerous climate change, India and China have an out clause in the negotiating text that's going to be signed in Paris at the end of this year. It says their first and overriding priority is pulling their people out of poverty and development, which, of course, makes sense. And so they have an out clause. So, in fact, we are headed towards another Kyoto. The Ontario government's doing the same thing. Thank you, Bruce. I think his phone died. It sounds like just it. like he said it would. Five two one eight two five five. Start call now. You have not heard the debate between Tim Ball and Elizabeth May that took place. No, yesterday. I, I, I heard about it, but I haven't. I haven't actually heard it yet. Now, okay. to your knowledge, have they ever debated each other before? No, I think this is the first time. I'm glad it happened, and I look forward because, to hearing it. Because I mean, you have to give kudos to Elizabeth May for putting herself out there. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And uh, uh, but you know, I, I've heard her enough to know how she was going to handle this. I mean, Tim Ball. <laughs> was bringing up scientific fact after scientific fact, scientific fact. And, and Elizabeth May is in denial like you wouldn't believe. She yeah. didn't even acknowledge, you know, uh, the scientific facts that were there. And remember, it is Ball that's got the degree in, you know, in, in climate science, not Elizabeth but May. But Elizabeth May is an exceptionally good arguer. Oh, she is. I she's mean, a lawyer. She's a lawyer. Yeah, yeah, she knows exactly. what she's doing. But you know when you but you know the first uh, rule of lawyering if you can't uh, 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 baffle them with brilliance you you, you well you know if you, that's right if you, you can't baffle be, them with BS yeah, and, you, and that's what she was doing the yeah, whole time yeah the, I think the expression is if you don't if you have the facts you pound the facts if you don't have the facts you pound the table yeah and that's yeah. what was happening at the climate hearing as well I mean the the town hall that happened here in Ottawa and that's happening in Guelph tomorrow night etc is is the environmentalists try to pound the table to shut you up yeah. because they don't want the issue raised. It's their religion. Yeah. The government, to their credit, let each of the skeptics f complete what they were saying, okay? It was the audience that tried to shut people up. And I really encourage people, you've got to go because this is a good environment to speak out in. It is safe. The government does allow you to finish what you're saying. You go to a Greenpeace meeting and try and say this, boy, you better check your tires on the way out. Yeah, yeah. yeah I've, heard, <laughs> I've heard those stories, too. Ask the government. If you look at the report here, the, uh, the climate change discussion paper, they know the future. Okay, they say in central Ontario, warmer weather is coming. They talk all about how warmer winters and summers. They, they don't actually look at the data. They, they know for certainty that it's going to be warmer. Yeah. And as, as I said at the beginning of the interview, we really don't know if it's going to be warmer or and colder. And the longest skating season in history on the canal. That's just a blip on the screen. That's, That's because of climate bear. change. That's because of climate change. <laughs> you know, you gotta, we got to take more of your money because we need, we, we need to affect climate change. And there's no way to measure it whatsoever. That's to save our polar bears. Well, yeah. one of the big, yeah, the polar bears whose numbers now are more than double they were in 1960. We saved uh, them. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. We saved them. But you, you know, you George, credit, you if, can credit Al Gore and David Suzuki and Elizabeth well, May for the salvation of the look polar bears. At what they're building and spending all this money on. Yeah, I asked. You know, I, I thought at first the government building. plan. Don't George, they're, they're spending. George, they're spending way more to battle climate change than any seed project in Norway, buddy. And that's why we're concerned with that more than anything. And that's what we're talking about here tonight. But your calls are always awesome, George. Five two one eight two five five is number to call. If you're on hold, you're getting on the air. Five two one eight two five five star five eighty on the Bell Mobility System. 
keeping the decision makers on their toes for more than 15 years. This is Late Night Council on 580 CFRA. And this is Rod in Ottawa. I think Rod's a first-time caller. Is that true, Rod? I guess it is. Oh, it is. Wonderful, Rod. Oh, my goodness. Good to have John, you. John, I'd like to thank you for all the work you've done down the years on this topic. It's... Um, it's been a lonely trudge for you, and I guess there must have been days when you thought, well, good <laughs> Lord. Today. <laughs> anyway, and hi to Tom there. And hi there. Also another fellow doing an incredible job. Um, I just wanted to say um, the Daily Mail Online reports that the Center for Policy Studies in Britain has just declared the, the British Renewables Program as the most expensive policy disaster in modern British history. Wow. It's running at £9 billion a year. Oh, my and it doesn't stop there. They say, well, if we adopt the renewables and just fixed up the old system to keep things going, we'd have to install 22 gigawatts of power. That's a lot of money. If we're going to stick with the renewables, with all the backups and stuff, you have to put in 50 gigawatts of oh power. My. This is it is absolutely well, astonishing. I mean, that's why country after country in Europe is are, are abandoning solar panels and wind farms because it's just way too expensive. The technology is nowhere near where it is, it is, uh, it is uh, viable enough to uh, supply people with power. Uh, again, and, and, uh, Tom, I was going to bring this up. Chalk River is shutting down. Mm. Chalk River is not going to be replaced. Mm. 80% of France's power comes from nuclear power. Okay? Environmentally friendly. It is clean. Doesn't hurt the environment. Why do we not hear Al Gore, David Suzuki, Elizabeth May, David Chernyshenko, and the rest of them, why are they so afraid of nuclear power when it is the cleanest, most affordable energy in the world? And, and our Canadian nu- nuclear reactors are the safest in the world. Yeah, it's mainly because of ignorance and also because them taking advantage of public ignorance. I mean, you're quite right. Nuclear is very safe. The storage of the most dangerous waste only has to happen for about four centuries. Four centuries after a Candu reactor bundle is removed, you can hold it in your hand. So storing it in the Canadian Shield would be extremely safe. Because, well, that's where it is stored. It's stored. Well, no, yet. not yet. I mean, it's stored above ground, and that's the problem. The Seaborne Commission in the late 1990s said that it was technologically very safe to store this high-level waste in the Canadian Shield because it's been stable for hundreds of millions of years, yeah. and you only need it to be stable for another four centuries. But they said it was socially not safe because the politicians and the media and everybody else were so uninformed that they would oppose building a you know deep uh, yeah, yeah. geologic storage. I've seen the schematics for them. Yeah, you know, so I, I mean, thought they I thought they'd gone ahead and built them because it makes yeah. so much sense. What's your problem? Well, Let's get ahead it. and do this. So instead, they leave it on the surface, more vulnerable to terrorism, and uh, you know we're just simply not storing the stuff properly. So the enviros basically have created a circumstance in which there is more threat. Not that it's a great threat, but there is more threat by storing it on the surface. Rod probably knows more about this than me. There's been a lot of work. They've done all sorts of work on it, and uh, there's always been that last thing, that the political part at the end has always been. I don't think there's any engineering problems with these things. I'm sure that George Zimmerman, before he went off to Korea, was told by Ontario Hydro, don't go with wind because it doesn't match. It's no damn good. But he not only went, but he didn't take anybody with him, deliberately so. He was on a political engineering job, not yeah. political science. He was doing political engineering, and it's deadly. Well, it's deadly. absolutely tragic how the people of Ontario, you know, are believing, you know, the consciences of these people, you know, to be able to to, to, to promote the, uh, this horribly inept science and extract billions of dollars from people. And ruin uh, our energy supply. Yeah, I know, and plunge us into debt where we're, you know, we're looking at uh, at, at tens of thousands of our young, uh, of, our, of our best and brightest, leaving the province when the whole thing goes collapsing. Because this, is, this has been a major, major contributor to our debt with our provincial government showing no sign whatsoever, not only of getting control of the debt, but not even any sign of that. They're acknowledging how bad it is. Yeah, and it's media-driven. I mean, this is the problem. It's media-driven. What does the media get out of this, Tom? Why well, is the I'll media pounding this? Yeah, I don't understand. I'll tell you why. It's they're because they're going to be losers just like the rest of it, us. There's two major reasons. One is financial. It sells media, and 
and they sell advertising, okay? If you have a large uh, printing company or a car company say that they're helping stop climate change by reducing greenhouse gas emissions, the last thing the newspaper wants is to have an op-ed on the other page saying you can't stop climate change, okay? And I was told that point blank by an, a major Canadian editor that they will not print our side because, quote, our advertisers wouldn't like it. It's so, bad for business. That's right. And the other reason is that the environmentalists have been very successful, either accidentally or on purpose, of labeling stopping climate change as a left-wing issue. And so without even understanding it, most of the media, which are left-wing, they just immediately adopt it yeah, and they yeah. fight for it. And that and that's really sad because it's not left or right. It's got nothing to do with it's it. It's, sci- bad, it's bad science. It's bad science. And as a result, people in the developing world are not getting proper support. And that surely should oppose or should appeal to the left that, that you know, that's one good reason oh, I, to look into it. From, from the way I see the left embracing this voodoo science, this religion, okay, the left is sending a very clear message to the poor of the third world. They can go to hell as far as they're concerned. They oh, don't yeah. care. They yeah. don't care. Well, Africa has oil. It has coal. It has natural gas. They're being told, no, you have, you have to develop yeah. using what we in the West can't afford to use. Yeah, not by China. China's buying up all sorts of swaths of area there. And yeah. they're, they know they know how, how empty-headed this science, this climate science thing is. And they're going to be in the driver's seat like no other country in the world as, as little and as 10 years think, from now. And what do you think they power their solar and wind manufacturing companies with? Good old-fashioned crude oil. And coal, actually. Coal, coal, yeah. coal, coal, yeah. coal, 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 to build the systems oh that God, the Western yeah. world buys from them to supposedly stop climate change. Rod, thank you for your call. Thank you, John and call, Tom. Call in Bye again now. sometime. You did well. 521-8255 is number to call. Here's Michael in Barhaven. Hi, Michael. Hi, John. Hi, Tom. Michael, you have a good phone. <laughs> oh, it's the old Michael we love and appreciate. That's coming awesome. Lo- coming in loud and clear. That's good. Just, just as an aside to uh, what Rod just said about the British situation, apparently but there's about 60% of the British coal reserves are still there underground, and there's a technology, liquid wow. coal, underground coal liquefaction, which apparently goes back to Soviet, <laughs> the Soviet area, era. There's a, an Australian company which has taken over the operation in, in Kazakhstan, which was started by the Soviets, but we also have in Canada and other places in the world. I read this in a science magazine a couple of months ago. This technology is being refined, and it's it's uh, something that we could be developing in the future. You won't have to actually send miners down to get the coal, apparently, and with this process. You, you liquefy li- it and you liquefy pump it up. the coal and you pump it up, yep. and there's no, no carbon emissions, apparently, if you're worried about that. Wow. Yeah. Uh, That's one other thing, if I had showed up at the meeting, unfortunately I couldn't, uh, I would have brought an article that I, that I originally saw in the Guardian Weekly a couple of years ago, and it's the UN Climate Fund sending billions of dollars to China and India to build high-efficiency coal plants. <laughs> Isn't that ironic? And I would have handed that out, and I would have been interested in some comments of some of the people there. Because, yeah. uh, well, you know, unfortunately, Harper just gave $300 million to the Green Climate Fund. And, you know, most of it is focused on this fiction of stopping climate change. It's really disappointing. I thought the Harper government would at least have open hearings on the science so we could see if this was worth doing. I mean, they don't have to have a point of view. They don't have to say we do or don't believe it. All they have to do is let the public hear the science debate from the scientists themselves. Yeah, let the truth come out. Just a couple of quick points that you may want to comment on. I'll let somebody else speak. One, uh, an article from a newspaper in November regarding glaciers melting, uh, um, Animals migrating north uh, and at higher temperatures, uh, you know, and that kind of thing. And it was mentioned on an American radio station I was listening to uh, last week. It was from November of 1922. Ah, geez. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, all you got to do is listen to Al Gore talking about how Mount Kilimanjaro was melting, and it was going to be all melted by, you know, in, in 10 years. And how many years ago was that now? That's about 12 years uh, yeah. now. And there's, more, and there's more snow on Mount Kil- Kilimanjaro now than there's ever been. Yeah, and the Arctic was supposed to all be gone by 2013, according to yep. Gore. Yeah, <laughs> and nobody is holding his feet to the fire. Yeah. Nobody is saying, excuse me, sir, we've watched your video, and, uh, you know, we've heard your predictions. You are full of crap. Sit down. But the, <laughs> <laughs> you know, he, he, did you hear what he said in Austin, Texas this weekend? He oh, said that climate yeah. deniers need to be punished. Oh, yeah. That's what he said. Yeah. The last thing is, uh, I think it was t- Tim Ball I heard on the radio uh, again within the last week or so regarding the ac- sunspot activity at, at the lowest since back in the 1800s, and that's responsible for the low temperatures we've been at record low temperatures. Right, yeah. Getting. yeah and you the, don't hear anything about that in the media. Yeah, well, people are going to have to start talking about it because if the Russians are right, we're headed back to the coldest in tw- 200 years by 2055, and that'll be disaster for Canada. Yeah, cold weather coming upon us is far more, uh, you know, is far more dangerous than hot weather. And they say nothing. 
I know. Up they, my long underwear. Yeah, you know, they say nothing in the climate change discussion paper about preparing for cooling. Oh, I'm sure Elizabeth May and David Suzuki and David Chernyshenko and Al Gore, they're going to find a way to blame, you know, the cooling of the planet. We're causing it, and the way we will solve the problem, give us more money so we can, you know, work the technology to change it, okay? Yeah. And there's people in Ontario, there's people that are dumb enough to believe that. And give their tax to do Not it. Not on yeah, my it's... watch. Tom Harris is at climatescienceinternational.org. Tom, thanks for coming in tonight. Thanks for your call, Michael. Appreciate you calling as well. Stay with us. This is the community's release valve. You're tuned into Late Night Council on 580 CFRA. Okay, we got about uh, 54, 53 minutes of program. Not including breaks for commercials and for news. And it is open line, open topic. Whatever you want to talk about, you can talk about it tonight, okay? Here's Owen's email. Hi, John. I agree with your guest, and I do not believe that we are in any way responsible for even the slightest change in the Earth's temperature. The real problem that we face today is that the overwhelming majority of the media is too lazy or afraid to confront these climate change liars and demand that they explain and debate their so-called facts. I hope that CFRA will lead the pack on this, but I will not hold my breath. Well, you know, the the climate change liars would probably like it if you hold your breath because that would be less carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere, and you might even save the planet by holding your breath, Owen. I don't want you to hold your breath either. I want you to keep sending in good emails like that. Appreciate that.